Mark chapter 12, like Pastor John said, we'll be in verses 13 through 17 today. And as you're turning there, I want to tell you about some expectations I had as a kid of what being an adult would be like. Um, first, when I was a kid, I thought for sure I would have a mustache because my dad had a mustache for a while. Not even like when I was, for most of my life, my dad has not had a mustache. But when I was really, really little, he had an awesome stash, and I would go into our living room, um, the, you know, the room that was not for playing in, but you could be in there if you were walking through. It had to be kind of nice. And there was a, a, my parents' wedding picture on this cabinet thing. And my dad had a sweet Magnum PI, thick black mustache. And that's the only time I really saw him that I can remember having a mustache. I've seen pictures when my older sister was younger and like when I was really little, really, really little, I think he might have had one. But other than that, I didn't have one. So I don't know why I was expecting that, but I did. I also expected that when I was older going to work, I'd have a briefcase because my dad had a briefcase. And I loved playing with it, you know, when you get the code just right on it because it was one of those locking ones. And you push the buttons and the latches would flip up. I thought that was the coolest. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to have a mustache and a briefcase. And the last thing that I was thinking about that I expected as a kid was I expected that I'd be going to a ton of dinner parties. And you may think, why would you expect that? Because my parents weren't going to dinner parties. There weren't other adults that I knew that were going to all these dinner parties. So why would I expect it? Well, I heard this enough that it led to this expectation that the quickest way to ruin a dinner party is to talk about religion and politics. And again, never been to a dinner party still. I've had dinner with friends, but I wouldn't consider it a dinner party. Um, and with my friends, we love to talk about those things, so not ruined. Um, Preston and I have had many a late night conversation when he's has his shoes on, his coat on, he's ready to go out the door, and we're just standing in my kitchen talking. Um, so I heard that enough that I thought that was a thing. And we are going to do, we're going to ruin a dinner party today, because we're going to be talking about religion and politics together. Now, some of you are squirming in your seats a little bit. Don't worry. We're not going to be talking about any elections that are coming up. We're not going to be talking about any politicians. None of that. So we can all calm down a little bit. Um, and in fact, let's pray right now so that maybe we can be approaching this topic with some, some ease and calmness. I know some of you guys are probably nervous already. Guys, I'm a little nervous right now because <laughs> um, I'm about to ruin a dinner party. Well, Jesus is, but all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that um, it's true. And uh, as the Pharisees say, but don't really mean, we mean it right now, Lord. You, you speak the truth and you show no, par no partiality. Um, you're not worried about what other people think. Um, you only give us the truth. And we just ask that um, we'd see that say in your word, that the words I speak would be from you, not from me, not my opinions, but um, what the word says, Lord. Uh, we ask for your presence here today. Uh, amen. All right, so let's read Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to trap him in his words. When they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful and don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought a coin. Whose image and inscription is this, he asked. Caesar's, they replied. Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. So like Pastor John said, this is on uh, Holy Tuesday, or as our life group would like to say, Tuesday, isn't it? Um, and uh, and they're, they're coming to Jesus. And who, who is the day that's coming to Jesus? Well, first, we look at the Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees, we've heard about them, we've been talking about them for a while. They're this religious sect, um, this Jewish religious sect, and they're really, really, really focused on following the law, following all of the commandments of God. Um, and uh, so they, they kind of formed because the, there's a group of people who realize that every time that Israel disobeys God, they end up losing something. Either their enemies come and conquer Jerusalem, or they get exiled, but every time Israel breaks their covenant with God, the, um, they lose their presence in the land. They lose their, um, their homes. They get, come under attack. And so the Pharisees are a group who, who is saying, we need to make sure that we follow the law exactly so that this doesn't happen anymore. Um, so uh, 
they're, they're kind of opposed to this group called the Sadducees, and we actually don't know a ton about them because they stopped existing. Um, but the Sadducees, they ran um, the temple. They were the ones who were the high priests. They were the ones who were in charge of, of that kind of temple state system. And they ended up really snuggling up to all these invading groups. They're like, we kind of want to stay in power. So they, they snuggled up to the Romans. They snuggled up to the Greeks before them. They were cool with Herod. They were all buddies. Uh, the Pharisees were complete opposite of that. They did not want to be a part of this system. Um, when Herod was the king, he asked for a pledge of allegiance to him, and the Pharisees were like, we are not going to do that. But they had enough clout and power amongst the people that Herod really couldn't do anything about it. When Rome would come in and conquer different regions, um, a lot of the places were uh, pantheistic or polytheistic. So they had a lot of different gods. You know, like we think of Roman gods, and there's Zeus, and there's Hera, and Hercules was in there, and there's Hermes, and maybe I'm saying the Greek names, but you get the picture. I always confuse Zeus, and I don't know what his Greek name is, and Mars, and they're all confusing to me. But you get the idea. There's all these different gods. And when Rome would conquer a place that had many different gods, they'd be like, okay, and add in to your list of gods, Caesar. He's one of the gods too. So you need to pray to the emperor. And the Pharisees were like, we are not praying to the emperor because there's only one God. And the Romans actually had some deference for the Jews and they said, all right, we understand that. Caesar's not a, we, we won't make you pray to Caesar, but will you pray for Caesar? And they were like, okay, we can do that. And then the Pharisees said, we're not going to do that. And Rome said, well, that's an act of war. And they came and they killed a bunch of Pharisees. Um, the Pharisees also held a ton of financial and spiritual and governmental authority. So because they were looked at as being upright and righteous and fair and good, um, because they're following the law so well, a lot of people wanted to do business with them. A lot of people went and, and talked to them about, um, if they had questions about what, what does the Torah say? What is God commanding us? Well, who would you ask? You'd ask the Pharisees, because they've studied it the most. Um, and they didn't always play nice with the people that were oppressing them, so the common people really supported them in kind of political endeavors, right? So when the Romans are taking over, and most people didn't want the Romans there, and the Sadducees were like, oh, it's okay, we can be friends with the Romans. The Pharisees were saying no, so they got the people's support. So if you look at the Pharisees, Throughout the Bible, we kind of see them as, as the heel, as the villain, as the foil to Jesus. And they were. They were. But if you were just an average Jewish person at the time, and say you were a parent and you had a daughter, and you had to marry her off to somebody, there's probably no one you would rather marry her off to than a Pharisee. They were following the law. They had um, financial security. They had prestige in your society. Really, outside of what Jesus was doing, the Pharisees were the good guys. We, we look at them and we say, oh, they're the bad guys, they're the bad guys. But in this context, they were, they were the society's good guys. And then we have the Herodians. Now, the Herodians were a group of people who were loyal to the king, to Herod. And who was Herod? Well, Herod was this, this puppet king. And I'll read to you a quote. Um, when I read for fun, I read a lot of nonfiction things and a lot of things talking about politics and religion. Um, and so I was kind of excited when I got this passage, even though I was a little nervous when I got this passage to preach on, because I was like, I got tons of material to pull from. So there's this uh, a, a theologian, his name is Richard Horsley, and he wrote this book called Jesus and the Politics of Roman Palestine. And he wrote this about Herod. He said, Herod was attractive to the Romans as a military strong man who could bring Palestine under control. Having risen to prominence by his violent treatment of the Galileans, he conquered his own subjects with the help of Roman troops. Herod became a model Roman client king. So the Roman Empire is huge, right? It's massive. It's the biggest empire at the time that the world had ever seen. You have pretty much all of Western Europe down into Turkey, pushing off into Asia a little bit, down into the Middle East, and then across the whole top of Africa. That's all Rome. But there's no trains, there's no planes, there's no cars, there's no emails, there's no phones, there's no not even um, Morse code. They don't have any of that. You know, there's no way to quickly communicate from here to there. To get from Rome to Israel would have taken a long time on a boat or an even longer time on a horse if you were lucky enough to have a horse or you're walking for like months to get to, to Rome. So Rome would install all these kings all over the place to kind of keep control over these areas that they couldn't be at all the time. And we even still see this today. The United States has 750 military bases in 80 different countries. 
Countries still today are kind of doing this where they're putting little outposts in different places to exert control over these regions that they can't be at all the time. So Herod was one of these guys, and he reigned from around 36 to around 4 BC, and Rome loved him because he did all kinds of things. Like he built new cities in honor of Caesar. We've, we've read about Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea, it's named after Caesar, and it was a city that didn't exist until Herod was like, by golly, I'm going to build this guy a city, and he just built it. We think of cities as like people moved there, and then enough people lived there. This guy was like, well, here's a spot where I can put a city. I put in it, and they'll come. They'll, if you build it, they will come, Field of Dreams style. Um, he also rebuilt the temple. So remember, the Babylonians come. They destroy the temple. The temple's not there for a while. And then Herod comes and rebuilds it, and it's huge, and it's massive. And the Jews are really excited about this, except for one little weird thing. Um, Herod decides that in front, on top of one of the gates, he's going to put the Roman eagle on it. So the Roman eagle was like, it's their standard, it's their flag, and he just slaps that thing up there. And the Pharisees were actually really upset about this. They were like, you're putting, you're putting the sign of empire on God's temple? What are, you, what are you doing? And they were so upset about that when Herod was on his deathbed, um, some Pharisees went, a group of Pharisees, there were these three like, leaders, and they had some followers, and they went and they, they cut down this, this eagle. And Herod, while he's dying, hears about this, and then gives the order that all those people need to be burned alive. So he was not a great dude. Uh, you you'll probably remember, about, uh, remember reading about Herod the Great when we read about the Christmas story, and the wise men come to Herod and tell him, we're going to see the king. And he's like, oh, tell me where he is when you find him so I can go and worship him. And they see through that, and they're like, ah, that seems like a bad idea. And then Herod ends up slaughtering every kid two years old and younger who's a boy because he's trying to figure out, well, if I can't figure out which guy it is, I'm killing them all, right? This is that Herod. Um, and so then after he dies, his kingdom uh, goes to his three sons. It gets split up into different areas. And so the two people, so these are the groups that are talking to Jesus. You got the Pharisees over here, super concerned about the law, super concerned about fidelity to the Torah, even though they get misguided oftentimes. And then you have the Herodians, who could not care any less about fidelity to the Torah or the law. They care about earthly power and, and following this king, or three kings, who are brutal and violent, but they give them security and power. And scripture says that they're trying to trap Jesus. Well, what is the trap? So we look at verse 14, and it says, When they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Do they think Jesus is truthful? Let's just start with their first claim. They say, Jesus, we know you tell the truth. I would argue probably not. Um, and I will point you to Matthew 23, verses 13 through 32. And I'm going to read most of it. I'm going to skip over 18 through 22, because it's not, Jesus goes off into something else. But I'm going to read you what Jesus says to the Pharisees. And you tell me if you think the Pharisees are being truthful when they say, Jesus, you always tell the truth. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you don't go in and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to make one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever takes an oath by the temple, it means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gold of the temple is bound by his oath. Blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the, gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And now we're skipping down to 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important things of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, so the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. In the same way, um, on the outside you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. 
And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we wouldn't have taken part with them in the shedding of the prophets' blood. So you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors' sins. Do you think the Pharisees agreed with any of that? Probably not. You don't probably go to someone who says, you are terrible, you are awful, and you say, you know what? Yeah, you always tell the truth. That's right, I am awful. So the Pharisees are already starting out not, they're not telling the truth, and they're saying these things to them. Um, and they say, you know, you don't care what anyone thinks. I think that's, that's true. We see Jesus time and time again giving hard commandments to people, and they turn away from him, and they walk away, and he doesn't adjust his, his theology, his teaching, to suit the people who he's, like, he doesn't say to them, you need to leave your father and mother. And they say, oh, that's really hard. And he says, oh, you know what? You're right. Let's, let's change that. Because it is hard. Jesus doesn't change for us. He's, he gives us a tough commandment. And he doesn't care whether we like it or not. That's what, is, that's what he wants. That's what he commands. And he doesn't show partiality. Again, let's look back just in Mark at who we've seen Jesus interact with. He's, he's talked to people who are demon-possessed. That the rest of society was like, we are staying far away from this dude. He's naked in a graveyard, covered in, in cuts. We're not coming close to him. And Jesus approaches that guy and shows him love and mercy. He approaches the people who are sick and unclean by the law's standards. The woman who's been bleeding for years, the, the lepers, the, the paralyzed people, the blind. He approaches all these people and he loves them. He's not showing partiality. He gives the same command to the rich young ruler that he gives to the poor of, of the day too. There's no person that he's like, you're gross or you're in the wrong class. He's not showing any partiality here. So the Pharisees, they don't, and the, and the, and the Herodians, they may not try to be saying something that's true. They may be trying just to butter Jesus up, but they're right. He doesn't show partiality. Everything he does say is true, and, um, and he doesn't care what anyone thinks. And so they ask him this question about, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, we think about taxes, and it's everyone's favorite thing, right? We love taxes. We have so many taxes today. We have sales tax. There's a, ga a gas tax. There's your income tax. There's your state income tax. There's some of you, unfortunately, even have to pay a Battle Creek income tax if you work in the city. Um, there's all kinds of taxes we pay all the time. And that was true also for the people of this day. So they were paying taxes to Herod, which was for defense, which is really, you're paying a tax, you're paying for your own oppression, which probably, I mean, a lot of people don't like paying taxes now, but you're not paying for a bunch of soldiers to come and abuse you and mistreat you all day, every day for the rest of your lives, which is what the Jews were doing. They're paying for Herod's defense. They were paying for his building projects, not just the temple, which I'm sure was probably a thing they were like, yeah, I'll pay for that. I want to see the temple rebuilt. But a couple weeks ago, we talked about Jesus walking through Jericho. And Jericho was the site of Herod's winter palace, which, you know, winter palace, don't need to say anything else. He had different palaces for different seasons. Um, you know, can you imagine, I mean, some of you may have this, this luxury, but I can't imagine being like, oh, yes, it's spring. Time to go to the spring estate. Now to the winter palace. Like, this is an extravagance and a wealth that we can't even, most of us cannot dream of. Um, and they paid for the administration of that, of the Herodian state, and also just to make Herod rich. He took more than what was needed to keep roads going or keep um, commerce up and running. He took it to make himself rich so he could have all the things he wanted. And then you had the temple tax. So every time you went to the temple to offer a sacrifice, you had to pay half a shekel. And we don't know what that means, so I looked it up, but that was about two days' wages. So... So it was a big deal to go to the temple because you knew, all right, I got to work extra hard because two days out of my week are going, are going straight to that just to show up at the temple. You also paid 10% um, of everything you, you made that year in a tithe to the temple. And then there were all kinds of small taxes like tolls and there were some property taxes. And, and this was a huge burden on the poor of the, of the time. And so much so that they would often lead people to go take out loans from the religious elites, mainly the Sadducees, because they had access to the temple treasury. And so they would say, I'll give you a loan. You, you need to pay a tithe or you need to pay this or that. I'll give you a loan. And the interest rate would be just insane. So they'd give you a loan. You'd pay them. It'll, when you paid it all back, they would give, take the money they took from the treasury, put it back in the treasury, and then keep all the, the interest for themselves. 
So you'll see Jesus talk about in other places in Scripture coming after these people and saying, you charge this insane interest on people and you're just preying on them. So my boy Richard Horsley again, he talks about this. And he says, the economic burden of rendering to Caesar was compounded by two layers of client rulers over the people of Galilee and Judea, both of which demanded revenues from the people. The high priests in the temple were already in place as, as the rulers when the Romans conquered. The Romans kept the temple state in place. Then, when they appointed Herod the king, he rebuilt the temple on a massive scale and expanded the priestly aristocracy with appointment of figures from the diaspora. Thus, in addition to the already existing uh, expectations of tithes and offerings, first fruits, and the temple tax paid annually by all adult males, considerably expanded revenues were needed, particularly to support the rebuilding of the temple, but also to support the high priestly aristocracy of four extended families. So then we get to this tax to Caesar, and, and like, should we pay this tax to Caesar? And it's not just a question of, guys, we're being taxed an awful lot. Should we keep doing this? He is asking, a, they're asking a question that's buried within a question. So this tax to Caesar is not a tax. Older um, translations, like I looked back, like the King James says tribute. Your translation might say tribute, and that's what it was. It was not a tax. It wasn't, I'm giving the government this money, and in turn, they're going to fund roads and bridges and soldiers and all that stuff. That's not what this was. This was a tribute. And to help us think about this, I thought about the great animated movie, A Bug's Life. And so if you've ever seen, let's go to the next one. Yeah. So if you've seen Bug's Life, you'll know what this is. If you haven't seen Bug's Life, here's the general plot of the movie. There's this colony of ants. And every year they have to gather up all this food for themselves, but also they put some on this pile of rocks and leaves and you see there's grains and berries and stuff. And they do this because every fall, a flock of grasshoppers is going to a swarm, I guess. They're going to come in, and they're going to eat it all, and they're going to go away. And they are threatening the ants the whole time. If you don't give us this stuff, we're going to, they say, we're going to kill your queen. And um, they're really afraid of it. And in typical Disney fashion, they will not show any of the people being, being killed. But it is highly, highly inferred. Uh, expected that you infer from this that the ants are being killed by the grasshoppers if they don't give them their food. And the queen, the, the princess, I guess, she's not the queen yet, she always is sitting in the tunnels going, they come, they eat, they leave. They come, they eat, they leave. Just trying to reassure herself, like, this will be over soon. And this is more like what the Romans were doing to the Jews. They were saying, you need to give us this tribute. What is a tribute? Again, I'll go back to, don't worry, I'm going to quote somebody else soon, but Richard Horsley it was a long book, and he had a lot of good stuff in there. And he said, The Romans believed that their own national security depended on the, subject, uh, on the subjection of other peoples by superior military force and by the extraction of loyalty or allegiance from them, as well as tribute, which was a symbol of humiliation as well as a source of revenue. So why are the Romans doing this? They're trying to say three things. We're going to humiliate you. You're going to know your place. Ants, you're going to know that grasshoppers run this place. You're going to know who you are. You're nothing but a tiny, no good. I think Hopper even says something. You're just a tiny, disgusting ant or something like that. And, and so Katie's laughing at me and now I'm having a hard time. Um, you're going to know your place, Israel. You're going to know that we are in charge. You're going to feel humiliated by this. You're also going to be doing this to pledge your allegiance to us, to Rome. Not to your kings, not to your priests, not to anyone else, to us. Your allegiance belongs to us. And we're going to make some money while we do it because why not? We can do it. We're going to make some money. This tax isn't just a tax. It's asking the people to give their allegiance to Caesar as God and king. Because these are the claims he made about himself. And so now we have to talk about this word allegiance. What does this mean? We use these words a lot. We use allegiance and loyalty interchangeably sometimes, but if you look them up, they do not mean the same thing. They're really, 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 really close, but they're not the same thing. So loyalty, the dictionary definition is it's a steadfast faithfulness. And this is to anything, really. You know, I'm loyal to my wife. I'm faithful to her. I'm loyal to my family. You know, I work hard for my family. I love my family. I'm not, I don't have a second family that I'm also trying to love and work hard for. I'm loyal, and you've heard it a million times to my Detroit Lions. <laughs> Through thick and thin, I do not abandon them. 0-16, don't abandon them. Two playoff wins this year? You better believe I'm not abandoning them. Um, I'm loyal to, to bands I like. Uh, my favorite band is this band called Oh Sleeper. There's a lot of screaming. A lot of you I know wouldn't be your thing, but for me, it's the best. And I've been to their shows, and I have their t-shirts, and I met the guys, and uh, I love this band. I'm loyal to them. If they put out music, I'm listening to it. 
Um, you can be loyal to lots of things. Allegiance is different because it is that a steadfast faithfulness, but it's to something specific. It's to a ruler or a king or a state. So when we say, oh, I have different levels of allegiances, there's no different levels. There is allegiance. You can have different loyalties, sure. Like, I'm more loyal to, I have to bring it back to sports because I feel like it makes the most sense with sports. So I was raised, you're not going to like this, um, as a Buckeye fan, OH. Um, and my dad went to Ohio State, my little sister went to Ohio State. So I was raised rooting for the Buckeyes. I remember being in fifth grade um, when Ohio State was playing in the national championship against Miami, and I got to stay up late, and it went to triple overtime, and my dad went to the hospital, and that's a whole different story. Um, <laughs> but I remember these Ohio State memories. I also went to Western Michigan, and go Broncos. And so a few years ago, Katie and I got to go down to Ohio State with my parents, because my sister was still going to school there, and Western, poor little Western, was going to play the Buckeyes in football. And did they get killed? Yes. But was I wearing my Western stuff there? You better believe it. And we're planning to go down this year when they, they're going to get pounded by the Buckeyes again, and I'm going to be wearing my Western stuff. I have loyalty to the Buckeyes. I'm rooting for the Buckeyes every year. I want them to win the national championship. I have loyalty to the Broncos. I want them to win every year. And if they could somehow manage a national championship, I would, I would faint. It's not going to happen, so don't worry about it. But I have these different loyalties that are kind of in the same realm. With allegiance, you, you can't do that. You can't have allegiance to this king and that king. You can't say, I'm a, I have this high level of fidelity and faith um, in the king of England and the king of France. For about 500 years, that would have gotten you killed to try and do that. This thing keeps messing around. Um, so do we see the difference here between allegiance and loyalty? They're not the same thing. So what are the Pharisees and the Herodians actually asking him when they're saying, should we pay these taxes? Should we pay these tribute? It's not about these things. They're, they're asking themselves, because many people found themselves unable to pay. Like, it wasn't uncommon that you could not pay this. There was, if, if you just factor in the every other year, 25% plus your tithe, I don't even know what Herod's thing was. It was the tax rate was variable for Herod because it's depending on what he needed. But just tithe and 25% to Rome, which you could count on every year, you're paying 22.5% of your income to taxes every year, no matter what. Which, when you're making nothing, that's a lot. And a lot of these people were just trying to get by every day. Um, so this isn't a question about taxes. This is a question about should we pledge our allegiance to Caesar, an earthly king? Should we pay this tribute to him? Does he deserve our, our, our allegiance? And how does Jesus answer? Verses 15 and 16, it says, But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought him a coin. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar's, they replied. So he knows their hypocrisy because they just said, you tell the truth all the time. And he's like, I just roasted you guys. I know you don't believe that I tell the truth all the time. Um, and this coin is important. What is a denarius? So it's this coin. It looks like this. This is one of them. And I don't read Greek, and I don't think many of you read Greek. So I'm not going to pretend to know what this specific inscription says. Um, but in her great book, highly recommend, The Ballot and the Bible, Caitlin Schess, she says... The coin the, the Pharisees and the Herodians presented would have had the image of the current emperor, that guy, uh, Tiberius, and an inscription that probably ascribed divinity to him, something like Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine high priest Augustus. The coins were basically portable billboards for propaganda for the empire that reminded people of Caesar's political power and divine authority. If you think about it, if you're spending money, and every time you go to spend money, there's the face of your oppressor on it, and it also says, by the way, I'm king and a god. Every time you go to put money into the temple tax, you're putting in this, this coin that many Pharisees said, this violates the first two commandments in the first place, because it said, you know, commandment number one, we know, no other gods before me. Caesar's saying on the coin, I am a god. And number two, no idols, no graven images. Well, here's an image of someone who says that they're a god, so it's kind of an idol. So every time you have this coin, every time you're, you're an average Jew running around doing business, buying bread, buying figs, buying whatever, you, you're interacting with this coin that's making a claim that Caesar is God and the king. This could probably be pretty irritating. <laughs> um, and so coins, coins throughout ancient times have been this way. They've, they've sent messages. So if you think about 
there was an, a small window after the Maccabees revolted where the Greeks are not ruling over Israel, the Romans haven't come in yet, the Jews have their own little kingdom for not very long, and they, of course, make their, all their own coins, and these ones had uh, a, a, a palm branch on them, which was a symbol of their independence. And if we think back just a few passages, we talked about Palm Sunday, and they're waving these palms, hearkening back to this period of Jewish independence because the king was coming. So even Palm Sunday, a little bit political, and we can't get away from it. So what is Jesus doing when he's having them look at this coin? He's drawing out into the open the claims that Caesar is making to Israel. He's drawing out to those, these people, making it plain. Caesar is claiming to be your king, and he's claiming to be your God. And he wants your allegiance. He wants you to acknowledge that Caesar is both of these things. Titles that belong to who? Who do the titles of God and king belong to? Not a rhetorical question. God, Jesus. They don't belong to Caesar. And finally, verse 17, he says, it says, Jesus told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. So this also begs a question, okay, Jesus, what are the things that are God's and what are the things that are Caesar's? How do we categorize these things? And we're really good at categorizing things in our lives, like, right? I thought categories, the first thing I thought of was like kingdom, phylum, genus, species, um, kingdom, family, phylum. I don't remember it all. There was a mnemonic that I used to know in biology classes, but we think about this, like we have animals and then we have vertebrates and we have fish and then there's maybe cartilaginous fishes and then sharks. And we, we love to categorize all these things. So categorizing between God and Caesars shouldn't be that hard. And at the time when the people heard this, they would have known exactly what to think. Um, Richard Horsley again, he says, the things that are God's in Israelite tradition were all inclusive, leaving nothing for the things that are Caesars. Well, he did not tell the people not to yield up the tribute for which they, he would have been subject to immediate seizure. Jesus stated simply and bluntly that the people did not owe tribute to Caesar. Because when you think about it, what belongs to God? Everything. Everything. And if the, everything belongs to God, does that leave any room for anything to belong to Caesar? No. There's, everything means everything. All means all. Words mean things. <laughs> That's the whole, if you don't take anything else away from this, Words mean things. Allegiance means something. Loyalty means something. All means something. So why are, the, are these, these two groups amazed? Because he didn't give them the answer to the question? No, he answered them the question they were asking. But he, he didn't give them the answer they wanted. Caitlin Chess again, she says, he did not ignore the question, but he used that question to draw attention to larger dynamics of the relationship between religious and civil obligations. They are amazed, it says, and they're amazed at his boldness because a popular figure, someone who has a following, someone who just two, two days ago um, had the city out throwing palm branches and coats before him, calling him a king, a popular figure like that who says, no, do not pay taxes to Caesar, that's a problem for the Romans, right? You can't have someone with all this popularity and, and um, influence just pretty much advocating for rebellion. He would have gotten killed right away for doing that. And the Pharisees, they want him to say, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, because then they can say, all right, we don't have to listen to this guy, because he is not being faithful to the one true God and king, God. So it's funny, these, these groups are trying to trap him. They both want different answers. The, the Herodians want him to say, no, don't pay taxes, so they can get rid of him. And the Pharisees want him to say, yes, pay the taxes, so they can get rid of him. Jesus was put in this lose-lose situation, and he got out of it, by going to what they're actually asking. And they're just amazed. They're like, man, we thought we really had him. We thought we had him trapped. He couldn't get out. No matter what he said, he was going to be in trouble with one of us. And he gets out. So that was a great look into the politics of first century Jerusalem. What does that have to do with us? Caesar hasn't been around. The last person that called himself Caesar was Kaiser Wilhelm in World War I. Kaiser means Caesar. There's a fun fact for you. Um, and we haven't had a Caesar around for over 100 years. So what do we do with this, John? So we're going to ask the questions we've been asking throughout Mark. First, who is Jesus? Jesus is God and King. And this isn't in the passage explicitly, but I'm going to read to you a bunch of other ones to support this. So those of you who are like, you didn't stick to the text. Okay, let's calm down. Um, here it is, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. 
For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. All right, so Isaiah, way back then, is saying he is God and he is king. Ephesians 1, 20-21, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who wills all things in every way, or who fills all things in every way. So Jesus here is seated at the right hand of, of God. He's given a th- a power and authority over every ruler in the age that Paul was writing this, but also in the age to come. So forever, king. Revelation 17, 14. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those, who are called, um, and, cho- and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Again, Jesus is king. Hebrews 1, 3, and 4. Son, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. So he's God. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. And if he's superior to the angels, he's superior to all the kings of the earth too. Jesus is God and king. So I think I've made that point. I don't think we need to labor and and linger on, on Jesus being God and king. So then we go to, well, what did Jesus do in this passage? Jesus sees our true intentions. We cannot hide from him. If you've been going to Gather and Grow, one of the passages we talked about was Psalm 139. And it talks about how God knit us together in our, in our mother's wombs. And there's nowhere I can go to escape. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Nowhere I can go. No depths that are too low to escape from God. I can't go to the heights and escape from him. I can't run away from God. We also talked about Jonah in Gather and Grow and how he tried to run away and he couldn't. Um, we can't run away from God physically, but we also can't run in our intention, in our emotion. He knows why we're doing things. The Pharisees were offering all these, all these sacrifices and all these um, offerings to the temple and to God, and, and they were doing it a lot of times just to be seen doing it, right? We talk, you hear about the, um, the tax collector and the Pharisee who are in the temple and they're praying, and the Pharisee is making a big show of it, and the tax collector is just in there beating his chest, it says, and weeping and praying to God. The intention there means something, right? Right? So God sees these intentions. The Pharisees and the Herodians, they didn't actually care about taxes. They don't care, really, about what Jesus has to say about this. He's just a guy. They want to trap him so they can get rid of this problem they have. And this is true for our lives, too, that we can try and give to charity. To, because, and we say, oh, I'm giving to charity, and that's a good thing. But why are we doing that? Are we doing that because we want to make ourselves look good and feel good? Or are we doing that because God says, love the poor and the oppressed and help them? God knows the difference. Jesus made a really clean distinction between God and Caesar. And these are different things, and we think a lot of times in our life, especially in America, we think, well, there's separation of church and state. These things don't interact. And I'm not calling for uh, a theocracy or anything. I'm just saying that we tend to think of these things as completely separate. I can hold a religious view, and I can hold a political view that contradict each other, and that can be okay. And Jesus is saying, no, these things, you can't separate them. Um, John Howard Yoder said, when Caesar, what is Caesar's and what is God's are not on different levels, so as never to clash. They are in the same arena. These things are not things we can separate in our minds and in our lives. We have to contend with what Jesus says first and always this, always what God says, and then that will form how we interact with a state. And Jesus lays out what Caesar has a claim to, everything that isn't God's. So again, that's what? Nothing. Caesar doesn't have a claim to anything. And finally, we ask, what does this tell us about the kingdom? It tells us that as Christians in the kingdom of God, our allegiance belongs to one king. We cannot pledge our allegiance to any person, place, thing, political party, symbol, nothing but Jesus. He is our only God and our king, and our allegiance belongs to him alone, nothing else. And this can be a hard thing to to wrestle with, because, I mean, I've been there for sure. I get really wrapped up in in the workings of God politics or whatever, and, and I wonder then, well, was my allegiance really with, with Jesus, or was it with all this other stuff that's going on? We can look at the way we spend our time and the way we, 
spend our money or the things that excite us for good or bad. Am I really, really agitated about this thing? Am I, am I really, really happy about this other thing happening in the world of, of government and state? Is it getting more, atten- more of my attention than Jesus is? We need to pledge our allegiance to one king and one king only. And I'll just leave you with this quote from uh, Bonhoeffer. Uh, I've talked about him before. He's a famous figure in Christianity. But if you don't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany who was uh, imprisoned and executed by the Nazis for resisting the Nazi regime. And he has talked a lot. He wrote a lot about these things. And he said this, um, If Christ is Lord, then Caesar is not. It's as simple as that. If Christ is Lord, then Caesar is not.